Hey guys, this is Echo Soundworks, and you are checking out a mixing essential tip and trick tutorial video. So in this video, we'll be talking about five common mistakes we make as producers, engineers, and DJs with compression. So let's dive right in. All right, the first common mistake that I see a lot of people make with compression is they, they start with a preset. There are some effects in some plugins where you can use presets like reverbs, delays, chorus, those types of effects. There are other types of plugins where you should be very, very weary of starting with a preset. And those are things like compression, EQ, gate, de that sort of stuff. Now, the reason for that is your compressor has no way of knowing very important and pertinent information to the compressor. So right, what you're looking at right now is the stock compressor in Logic. And let's say I want to compress this. This synth sound, right? And let's say I go and there's no synth category, but there's a keyboard and I choose pop piano. Let's do pop piano. Okay, and let's say I just play it. Well, I didn't really do anything, so I'll keep going through my presets. All right, that one did something. My track sounds louder. Right? So it went up three decibels. Uh, I'm peaking about negative 14. And went to about negative 11. So this would, might, this would maybe fool you into thinking, oh, yeah. That's some good compression right there. Well, it, it might be, but you could also just turn up, I could turn my fader three decibels and see if it sounds the same. And it doesn't sound a whole lot different, right? <laughs> so that's why you should, the reason you shouldn't use the, the presets is the person who made this plugin, they, they could be the greatest engineer ever. The problem is they don't know what your input, what, what the input coming into the compressor is. They don't know how hot or how quiet your signal is. Therefore, they're going to have a very hard time setting the threshold. And then it kind of, it kind of balloons from there, right? If you don't know the input and you can't really have an accurate gauge of how hot or quiet the input is, you can't really set the threshold. And if you can't really set the threshold, well, then you can't really set the ratio. And that's before we even get to attack and release. So if you find yourself using presets a lot with compression, it means that you're probably not comfortable with the controls in a compressor. I would suggest that you get a little bit more co comfortable and familiarize yourself with one or two compressors and get very comfortable using those before you start using other compressors. All right, so another common mistake that we'll make, and you saw kind of this happen, this play out in the first mistake is you don't gain match, you don't output gain match. So compressors can add volume to your tracks, right? Because there's gain controls. And part of a compressor's job is to make things seem louder if that's the type of compression you're trying to achieve. So I use compression on this track. I use the DBX 160 by way. Okay, so with it on, I peak at negative 13. With it off, I peak at negative 13. That, I had to crank up the output gain to get that to happen. So I didn't load up a preset for this, kind of building off of our previous section of this video. I just messed around with the controls until I got something I like. Now, this compressor I've only been using probably consistently for maybe two or three months. Um, I, it was something I had for a while I just hadn't used, and I needed to really dive into it to get comfortable with it. But I had to match the gain here so I could actually hear if it was making the sound better. And the thing that I liked about it is that it makes the reverb more present coming out of Serum. Check it out. Kind of levels it out. So I'm not really losing any gain here with in terms of like my actual on my actual fader, right? Because I'm peaking at a similar volume or pretty much the exact same volume. It might be a little bit different. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time gain matching. I didn't get really scientific, but it sounded good to me. And I got a little bit, I got pretty close with the gain match. Right, and then I also turned up a little bit of the noise. So some compressors will add their own little like sonic flavor to the sound, and that is something that's quite nice. And it may not add volume, may not affect the dynamics of the signal, but it may affect the overall timbre of the sound. 
All right, so the next really common mistake that I see all the time is, is putting it on everything, putting compression on everything in your mix. I would say most mixes don't need as much compression as you think they do, and you can really kill a mix with compression. Take it from me. I had this whole phase where I would like compress everything, and my mixes sucked looking back on it. it just it, They didn't have life. They were squashed. And it made mixing harder. It, it, when you have like 15, 20 instances of compression and you're trying to all get it to play nicely together and like you're using multiple different versions of our different types of compressors, it's, it's a shit show. So if you're finding yourself compressing a lot, you're actually putting on a Band-Aid for other issues in your mix. It's usually balancing, uh, kind of, you know, getting like a good static mix going and, and balancing levels. So if you're finding yourself compressing all the time on everything, it's probably two things. What I just mentioned with balancing levels, and it could also be you're, you're choosing bad samples or you're choosing weak sounds or you're not recording hot enough, that sort of stuff. So don't compress on every track. You don't need to. You'd be surprised, especially with modern-day synths like Serum that have high-quality compression in it. You Usually, presets will have a compressor on it or contact libraries use compression, that sort of stuff. So you don't really need a whole lot of compression. I would say vocals, kick drum, snare drum, and maybe like the main sound in any section might benefit from compression. But if you find yourself putting compression on like choirs and pads and that sort of stuff, <laughs> look at yourself in the mirror. So another common mistake that a lot of DJs, producers, and engineers will make with compression is they will compress all at once. So you're compressing quite intensely or quite a lot with one instance of a compressor. Compression's kind of like, um, I guess like a good analogy would be painting almost. Like where where if you're trying to like make paint a sunset, you can't just put like a crap ton of orange on one part of the painting. And the, like, I mean, maybe you could if you're going for that, but like for the most part you paint in strokes, right? Or if you're painting a wall, right? You paint, you, you put the primary, then you put the paint, you let it dry, put another layer of paint. Compression works in a very similar way. It works better when you do it multiple times lightly as opposed to once really strongly. And it will even, once you start to get comfortable with multiple compression plugins, it gets fun to kind of blend like the sound of a certain compressor with the sound of another compressor. And it can really shape tones and textures of instruments in a unique and interesting way. The final mistake that I see a lot of producers make with compression is they obsess with the compressor, the compressors of yesteryear. And I know I'm going to get some slap back for saying this, but I find it hard to believe that in the last 50 or 60 years, there has never been a compressor that's come around that has as good a sound as a 1176 or a, a two, uh, an LA-2A. I'm not saying they're bad compressors. I use those compressors in plug-in formats all the time. I'm saying... Those shouldn't be the holy grail, end all, be all. There's a lot of interesting compressors out there, especially in the digital era. And it's really interesting to get slightly different flavors of compression on your mixes. So a lot of the, like you know, 20, 30 years ago, to even 15 years ago, where if you're still mixing with a lot of hardware analog compressors, it was really expensive to have five to 10 different really high quality compressors in your studio, right? So that's why a lot of those guys mixed with the same two or three or maybe four compressors all the time. They sound great. They worked. They were comfortable with them. And y you don't want to drop, unless you're, you know, like, <laughs> like Chris Lord Algae, you don't want to drop six figures on compressors too much, right? So the thing with only using like a like a 1176 emulation or a LA-2A is that you're kind of selling yourself short in the digital age. There are a lot of cool compressors out there. There's the Fab Filter. There's some great Slate plugins. There's the Waves DBX. The Waves has the CLA. I mean, there's tons of them. There's, there's Cytomic Glue. I could keep going on and on and on. But try messing around and getting comfortable with three to five compressors because your mixes will be more dynamic. They'll have more of a rich texture and character when you start to introduce these different compressors to your mix. All right, guys, that sums up this look at five common mistakes that producers make when they're using compression. If you have any comments or questions, I'm sure we'll get a uh, cool discussion going on this video. Post them up below. I will try to respond to any question or comment as soon as I can. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm Echo Sowers. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I will see you next time.